and my monster then resumes to say it was a cover-up, a scam, a lie. We celebrated my death with wine and crusty bread at the little table in the garden overlooking the lake where fictitious bubbles rose and burst, my phantasmic epigraphs. I had my privacy, I had my life, and I had Mary. I alone remember the real Mary, her curious mixture of reticence and passion, the part that twisted under me with a dark satisfaction, and the part that wiped her hands afterwards and twitched the curtains open with punitive haste. You can see it in her book, how she embeds her tale in a double thickness of letters and second-hand accounts, as if every precaution were needed to secure the monster behind those locks and screens, or as if she placed a soiled cloth in an envelope and then a reticule so that it should not graze her fingers, pretending that that, that smeared rag did not reek of her private parts. I saw it in the pages of her journal, carelessly abandoned on a seat in the garden, weighted open with a magnifying glass and smoking in the intermittent sun. Now here, a link from the word journal takes you to Mary Shelley's account, this time not authored by the original Mary Shelley, but by myself. And in this section, Mary Shelley's going for a walk and comes across her own monster. Stark naked, standing as still as if I had not yet breathed life into her massive frame and waiting for me. She held in one hand a scrap of cloth I recognized, all that was left of the clothes I had thrust upon her when she fled me shortly after her conception, the rest she had lost or cast aside. I could not help but quail before the strangeness of this figure, from which I fancifully, fancifully imagined the very blades of grass seemed to shrink. But curiosity, compassion, and a kind of fellow feeling was the stronger impulse, and I forced myself to continue. Now here, there are two links, um, one written, one sewn, and these represent sort of the parallel paths of the metaphor that I'm develop developing throughout the course of the entire hypertext, in which the body is in one sense a body of text, and it's therefore written, and in another sense a literal physical body that must be sewn together writing becomes like stitches and stitches become like writing. Um, and the reader has to choose which way they want to go, although if they want, they can go back and check the other one out. I'll take writing, just for the hell of it. I had made her writing deep into the night by candlelight until the tiny black letters blurred into stitches and I began to feel that I was sewing a great quilt as the old women in town do night after night, looking dolefully out their windows from time to time toward the light in my own window and imagining my sins while their thighs tremble and the heavy body of the quilt heaped across their laps and their strokes grow quicker than machinery and tight enough to score deep creases in the cloth. I've looked with reciprocal coolness their way, not wondering what stories joined the fragments in their work baskets. So I'm actually gonna go back and read the other one. So you see how they parallel each other. I had sewn her, stitching deep into the night by candlelight, until the tiny black stitches wavered into script and I began to feel that I was writing, that this creature I was assembling was a brash attempt to achieve, by artificial means, the unity of a life form, a unity perhaps more rightfully given, not made, continuous, not interrupted, and subject to divine truth, not the will to expression of its prideful author. Authoress, I amend, smiling. I approached her slowly over the small stone bridge. She trembled slightly, and her left leg jerked as if it would flee alone if need be, but she held her ground. She was stark naked. I noticed what I could not have seen in the dim light of my laboratory, that the various sectors of her skin were different hues and textures, no match perfect. Here, a coarser texture confused the ruddy hue of blood near under the skin. There, smooth skin betrayed a jaundiced undertone. There, a dense coat of fine hairs palely caught the light, warm brown neighbored blue-veined ivory. I thought of the tree that stands by the house. I've often noticed that a length of cloth, however richly dyed, cannot match the beauty of or sustain the interest of autumn foliage. I believe it's because the myriad differing hues while tending toward the self-same yellow one can achieve with a broth of turmeric, say, or onion skins, creates a disturbance of other colors around the root color, a penumbra, a kind of three-dimensionality of color. 
in this way, she was beautiful. I'm clicking on through this section, which is quite linear, um, to get to the section that I'm not going to read, but I'm going to show you where uh, Mary Shelley makes love to her monster. Um, and then I'm going to actually jump back to the original overview and take you to the graveyard to show how those different colors, those different textures of skin that I was describing that, um, that, stand, that represent the parts of different bodies of which she was composed, um, each acquire their own story in my hypertext. So you enter the graveyard and you s are confronted with a tombstone and there are multiple links you can follow from that. Um, one thing <laughs> that I discovered just now um, is that one of my original intentions here um, is like was not it's not quite manifest in its in this current version. Um, if you click on, say, the right arm, you get the option to read about the right arm, but you also get a right arm view, or in theory you do. It turns out you get a black bar. Um, but the, my original idea was, and you can see it if you click on the head, that in addition to reading the text, you get a visual image of the body part named and then can actually move them around to reassemble a body visually, as well as in a virtual sense, by you reassemble a body by reading about all the different body parts. So that's an unrealized <laughs> authorial intention. But here I'm going to actually just read some of the texts that are associated with the head. My skull is like an ancient vase, scratched from the dust with toothpicks and paintbrushes and reassembled on a desk. There are fragments enough to make a vase, but how many vases shattered for this one? An archaeologist made a pot, that's all we know. Sometimes when it's quiet, I hear in my ears the roaring of a crowd. Eyeballs. My eyeballs are wondrously firm and spherical, my vision clear and sharp, my gaze calmly speculative. I can peruse with equal clarity the finest of print and the faint script of smoke from a distant chimney. I owe this to Tituba, who loved to read. Born crippled, what else could she do? In her room at the top of her father's house on high ground at the head of a valley, she pored over volumes of history, law, literature, and medicine, but shuffled among the pages as many careful readings of the scene outside her window. She knew who visited whom and surmised why and waited while other carriages, horses, and foot travel printed other plot lines in the thick mud for her expectations to find fulfillment in the figure of a priest, and none too soon because the dresses hung on the line outside the blue cottage were ever more capacious, and at the foot of the valley where the road fort she thought she saw the lead horse, a chestnut mare of the doctor's team emerging from the mist. In her old age she penned a history of the village which astonished all. For what could a poor invalid confined to a chair know of their doings? Lips. They say they've proved in tests that if subjects are instructed to consciously contract certain facial muscles, notably resorius, a ring-shaped muscle that surrounds the mouth, until any onlooker would call them happy, they experience a corresponding lift in mood. If they frown, they feel sad. Margaret laughed so freely, sh shoulders shaking, stomach heaving, saliva bright on her lips, that the townspeople frowned on her, caring for her aging father and her idiot brother as she did, tending her neglected garden when she could to coax forth its meager yield of cabbages and yams. What cause did she have for laughter? When a baby came and people whispered that her brother had to do with it, they waited for her smile to fade. It didn't. The baby came out screaming with laughter, and even the midwife had to smile. I wake up laughing from a sound sleep and giggle when I'm solemn, or irate, which damages my dignity. I laugh at pain not because I'm strong, but because it's funny. My lips always get the joke. A little later, so do I. This is the last I'll read of this section, but my 
that's about the tongue. My tongue belonged to Susanna, who talked more than she ate and ate more than the baker and butcher combined. A mountainous woman, a scandal, dubiously housed with a set succession of more retiring lady sponsors. At the pub, she bartered talk for food and drink, and you may adduce she did well enough by the fact vouched for by the seamstress that while her waistband was occasionally let out, it was never taken in. Pour her a pint and she'd talk all night. Her tongue, my tongue, stirred up a rich and fishy stew of folly, poetry, gossip, heresy, and the news, and she mixed up the real and the imagined, so you never knew where you stood with her, and might imagine a dream to be the veritable state of things, and the reliable latest from Milan, gleaned from a gypsy tinker, who overheard it from a working lady, who got it off her gentleman visitor, to be a feckless fantasy. Stuck in the stocks for drunken licentiousness, she soliloquized all night, and crowed the town awake at dawn with the most arrogant cock in the square. The insomniac girl child of a well-to-do couple on vacation wrote down Susanna's words and made a wicked poem of them. The poem, published under a masculine pseudonym, became the talk of the continent, enthusiastically quoted and passed round by the young men in her set. They whisked the familiar pages out of sight when she approached, as unfit for the eyes of a lady. Now I'm going to head out of the graveyard. Burdened with body parts, your fingernails packed with mud and chips of bone, you slink out of the graveyard. A kind of resurrection has taken place. And now you're back at the beginning here and can choose another course. And what I'd like to do is take you to the quilt. Um, you'll remember that I established this parallel between sewing and writing, and here it's taken in another direction.